I'm delighted to be here. Oh, I should introduce you, but I'm assuming you need no introduction. Mm -hmm. Do we need to introduce you? Well, I'm Sue Wontrow. I'm a <laughs> professor of biochemistry at the Health Science Center and have been doing mass spectrometry for a gazillion years and um, really have been a scaffold user from the beginning. And it completely changed the way. I've had a course since 1979. Totally changed the way we did our work. I can remember originally sending out data from SDOT searches on these big piles of papers and to be able to send a file that was really meaningful to the users was tremendous. But besides just that convenience, the additional information that you can get from using the scaffold products makes the difference between providing a service and providing collaborative information that really advances the user's work. And today I'm going to show you a little about some ways to explore data uh, with Scaffold. With the new technologies and new instrumentation, it's amazing that we can now have thousands and thousands of proteins reported from different experiments. But from the old days where you might have a small enough number that you would manually go through them, you need to be able to find trends and understand is this data set worth pursuing or not before you spend a lot of time on it. So how do we start with this interpretation? There we go. Okay. okay. I'm going to show you a few examples. Um, and uh, this one is something that's really quite recent from the lab. Uh, Sam Pardo is often coming up with little experiments to try and optimize technology and verify uh, what is the best way we can do things. I think all of you know that you can spend years just finding the very optimum way to do something. But he'll come up with a little quick experiment. In this case, we had a few questions. Now, we've been doing a lot of DIA work. And let's have a point to mm -hmm. If you hit the center the button. Center, the yep. black button. Yep, you got it. And uh, what he also likes to do is come up with an experiment and not tell me at first what he's done and wants me to do data processing first and try and figure out the answer before he'll give me information. And with the flexibility of the products, I'm able to do that. In this case, we had a few questions. Replicate samples. We're doing our data processing, especially for DIA, using S-traps from Protopod. Absolutely fabulous devices but there's a limited number that you can do in a day. He wanted to know if it processes two days in a row, is there an, any problem in using the data together? Uh, we wondered about protease inhibitors, especially since we've been doing more tissue samples. We're using something called a pressure biosciences barocycler. It's a marvelous way to homogenize small amounts of protein, but uh, do you need a protease inhibitor in there? What about the time and sample preparation? Can you pre prepare a sample one day, analyze it the next? And, and also, uh, as traps come in uh, several sizes, and there's a mini and micro, we wanted to look at that in comparison. So he set up this experiment. Now these are four separate pieces of muscle tissue from Baboon that a collaborator provided. Um, these are the same animal, but two different pieces of tissue. So I have to emphasize that it's not an aliquot of the same homogenous, and two different animals. Now I will say, this one had BL and this one had M, and I didn't know if that was some special designation as well. Uh, not clear at this point. But So what he did, they're numbered sequentially, homogenized the sample on day one, processed 100 micrograms of protein in the S-trap. And I'll uh, say as an aside, we use a protein quant before we put the sample on the S-trap, and then we use the Pierce or metric peptide quant after. If we're looking at exactly the same quantities on, I want to know how much I'm putting on for DIA, not just make an assumption. I started with a certain amount of uh, digest. 
So this is the same homogenate here, day one, day two, and then split it up and put half and half on a third day on a micro, and so on uh, for this set. For our DIA, I'm not going to go into the details. We uh, have it optimized. Brian helped me tremendously for this. And I pack my own columns, so they're a little broader than the people who use the commercial columns, or Brian packs them really well. But uh, this, these are the settings that I have. You can get uh, recommended settings for all kinds of different instruments from the Creop software website. I strongly recommend starting with their recommended settings. Uh, we do uh, experimental samples using uh, 12MZ windows and a uh, staggered scheme. And then also we generate a chromatogram library using narrow windows and gas phase fractionation. And what has totally made it possible to do DIA in the lab is the fact that the scaffold DIA can be used for processing everything. And we really didn't have the time to go find different mechanisms to do it. I think you'll hear more about that from Brett later. This is what we did for this experiment. Um, I will say that we uh, generally run a couple of so-called prep samples into the column first. In Brian's experience, he's found that it, even though you're using a column that you've been using for a while, it's nice if you put that very sample on a couple times, inject. And sometimes, depending on our experiment, we've acquired DDA using a full-length a chromatogram uh, gradient and can process both the DDA and then the DIA and it's it's more to give you a different uh, picture of the results but I am so impressed with DIA I'll say to me it's the most exciting thing I've been working on in the past at least 20 years so the organization view is astounding to me because now you can really explore your data and ask many different questions. So for this experiment, we had this designation, and that was the M and DL. The investigator says M was muscle and DL is fastest um, letter, letter Alice, and that they're both muscle. I don't understand, but uh, I think it's the same. So I didn't uh, follow up with the designation. But we have a different animal, the day, the different S-trap, and plus or minus protease inhibitor. And it's very easy uh, to do the subsequent evaluation. I'm excited that the new version is out to make it a little more facile to enter these categories. But you can put these in later. You don't put them in at the beginning of the experiment. You just enter your uh, sample designations. And here's the output of a DIA experiment. You'll see I've blown up the pink part here, the dashboard, so that you can see the information. Uh, this was a muscle homogenate uh, we were analyzing, and it is baboon. Uh, I was surprised to me this is a relatively low number of proteins, and I'm pretty sure this is because it's not a very complete uh, FASTA database. I chose not to try and map, in this case, to human uh, because uh, all my future samples on this particular project will thankfully be human. But uh, another important part is that in most of the DIA work I'm doing, I use exclusive intensity. You don't want to have to worry about shared peptides, and this way you have absolute confidence that that peptide is representing the isoform or proteoform that is listed there. And you'll also see that this is a very familiar output from your other scaffold uh, products. Here I've divided between animal, and just looking in general, this is intensity, and you can see they look uh, fairly reproducible. So the, the color scheme, what you have to remember is that the upper level here um, stops in the high E8s, and so if you have E9s and E10s, you're not going to see any color difference. You can also combine or roll up the results where you're presenting the median for any one of your categories. And it's a nice way, once you've looked at the replicates and you feel confident that they are representative and, and uniform, uh, it's a very easy way to view the result. But you can start seeing that there are some differences just based on the color here. Uh, 
You can start adding in the different categories. So here I've divided, subdivided into the micro and mini S traps. Now I'm adding the day of the analysis. I'm not going to go through the results there. Um, I chose perhaps looking at plus or minus the HALT protease inhibitor or putting them all together where you start being able to say are there differences in these experimental parameters that I have to consider. But of course looking at it this way it's wonderful to be able to get a view based on the colors but you need to do something a little bit more quantitative. And then it's wonderful to be able to use PCA, uh, principal component analysis. Everything I'm showing today is going to be just comparing the uh, PC1 versus PC2. And visually, you'll, you'll notice you have the different PCA tests here. Whichever one you selected is magnified. And you can also see that by the end of the analysis, how far and how much of the variation or variance has been explained. Here, as a comparison though, what you see is these have not been organized into any attribute groups yet. And it's very clear that you have a huge separation between two. And what you notice right off is, all right, here's this animal, day one, two, so numbers one through eight, and they're all over here. And this animal is over there. So there's something vastly different right off between the results for these two animals that is not experimental. Now you also see very nicely one and two, three and four, each of the replicate samples cluster close to each other. Again, this gives confidence just looking at this without putting into any kind of organization. And if I then organize at the animal level, it makes it very clear that you see there's a cluster for the S-trap micro, the mini, and these are a little bit more spread out. But clearly, there's something different between the animals. Now, I also tried organizing by the different categories that I had set up. So that's by S-trap. And you can see the colors here in, in the legend by day and by plus or minus halt. Well, I was really happy to see this one because day one and day two for the mini, they are all together. So that means that we can process on two different days and then analyze together in the mass spectrometer. Um, and that's very important to know because some of the experiments are just too large to be done realistically in one day. Um, also with the protease inhibitor, I'll show you a little more of the results shortly. Now this is a wonderful feature to be able to use the heat map because you have PCA that's showing you some of whether there's separation. Uh, I particularly like to do this for every experiment is put it in run order first because you want to be sure that there's not some instrument or systematic error that's coming up. And you'll see it very clearly if you suddenly see a trend and of course, all of our DIA experiments, like those others, are blocked and randomized, so the injection is not by group in any way. Well, you do notice there's some kind of a pattern here, and also uh, they're clustered according to other features here, but that pattern is going to end up being from the different animals. You can see very clearly the bars, and when you look up at the sample names, then you will end up finding out that that's from the different animals. Now I've grouped them by animals here, and you can see the designation. If you pick a certain region, you get, then get it expanded, and over to the right where I'm not showing are all of the protein names. So if you see something interesting, you can uh, highlight and click and take them into Excel. But here's a different region, and it's quite amazing looking because for this animal, there's quite a bit of variation in those proteins among the samples, while on this animal, not so much. And so this is going to be important both from a methodological point of view and to see if there's something interesting about that 
a particular uh, protein. And here's just another area where you see quite a bit of similarity on one side and not on the other. Now here is everything all together. And uh, then I wanted to just show a little bit about, we're, we're still asking this question, what do we need to do for this experiment? It's very nice to be able to look at it with a log two-fold change, shown here, where I made the uh, decision to show this normalized to one of the samples, just for convenience. And you see really striking differences over in the second animal. Uh, and this is the HALT plus and HALT minus there. Now one thing that's important to point out, and where another of the major strengths in the scaffold being able to look at the data, is that this is exclusive intensity. If you have a protein where there is a large number of shared peptides, it may be identified on 100 or 200 peptides, it may be quantified on two or three. And so it's very important to be able to go look in. If you see a protein that's giving you a very unusual result, make sure you go and look at it and that uh, the peptides are giving you the quality result you want. Here I've highlighted one region and it's very fascinating to see. This is HALT minus, and in this case you actually have more. Remember, green is higher. Uh, green, uh, this protein replicates are higher than with, with the HALT, but then there's other ones that are in the other direction. If we go over here, you see another where it is down the other way. After looking at this together, we decided it seemed fine to be able to process on two days if we have to. We'd rather do it on one day. Halt doesn't seem to make a huge difference. We're going to add it regardless, but I don't think it's going to hurt anything. But clearly the S-trap size is a difference and that we need to be sure that we are using only one. Well, we would only use one, but suppose you have a sample that's very small and the rest are larger. We'll have to figure out what you're going to do there. Uh, this is just showing it rolling up into the groups where you can see the changes uh, visually. All right, next I'm going to show you about uh, an experiment where you get some really clear results, but it also does give you some subtle information this way. An investigator came in and had cells that he wanted to look at the chromatin fraction. The cells had been transformed from one parental strain into something very different. For years, we have done 1D gels first and cut slices, process each slice by digestion, production alkylation, digestion, run by MS, uh, database search, and then combine the results in the so-called mud pit version in a scaffold. And very uh, labor intensive, but also very informative. Not as great for quantitative, for sure. Um, here's the result of looking at one of those lanes, we got 2,000 proteins. We had no idea what to expect. And for an experiment that I've not done anything on that sample, it is reassuring to do the traditional method before DIA just to make sure what to uh, anticipate. And here we see just the total spectrum counts as usual on scaffold. That gave us confidence to then tell the investigator we'll go ahead and do some replicates this was in preparation for the DIA experiment where we ran the DDA first for the full gradient, looking at it first in scaffold. Now, that was processed using mascot and mascot distiller to generate peak areas, then taking it into scaffold Q+, and then ultimately you'll see into perspectives. But here, we got a few less proteins. But remember, the other was fractionated into six slices, and this was just one, a two-hour gradient and we got 1766, and just comparing the cell one and two, and they, this is total spectrum counts. Um, if you do a t-test comparing the two, and then sort on p-value, you can see there's really some very striking differences here. What's particularly important is you've got certain proteins where there are no spectra detected. 
we don't know at this point. Is there really none of that protein, or was the level just too low to generate an MS2 and be counted? Uh, interestingly, it was such different, it's all the way down to protein number 788, a cutoff for uh, significance with multiple testing correction. Then I took it into, and you can't see down at the bottom, but this is perspectives, and that's just the same data that it's uh, reproduced on the perspectives samples view. But now we can easily look at the precursor intensity where you start seeing some difference visually. You know, and again, if, if you're not, either have, don't have the instrument or the desire to do DIA for an experiment, this is a wonderful way to get quantitative information. Looking again at the log two fold change, it highlights the very striking difference between cell one and cell two. Again, the PCA, and I wanted to show you one that's very clear. Uh, and I'm just highlighting here, uh, there's no question cell one and cell two separate very strongly. Now, that's just a weighted spectrum count. This is not always something you're going to be able to do uh, uh, for all experiments. And now if we look at precursor intensity, you start seeing something a little interesting because in this cell, which is before transformation, they look like they cluster tighter. Uh, and there might be more variation here uh, after the transformation. Uh, that's just uh, showing it expanded. All right, now we took these samples and uh, the scheme that we do is we'll run the first block randomized of the DIA samples, then the six pooled samples for the chromatogram library, then the rest of the samples, so that they're sandwiched in between. Well, now look at this. Instead of the uh, previous 1,700, we've got 3,300 targets with uh, identified through DIA. From, these are the exact same samples. And this, again, is run order. It's very important to me to look at the run order and make sure there hasn't been a problem. This is the top of the list, and that's further down. Now, you see the pattern where you again would know right off what was happening. Now it's organized by cell, and I'll notice here cell two and cell one because when I made the designation just in the organization view, by mistake I called the other ones backwards. And so just so you'll see, You'll, you'll see how that um, reflects later, but uh, this is the beginning cells and then this after transformation. Really amazing difference. Now we go all the way down to number 2465 that have a statistically significant difference with multiple testing correction. Again, exclusive intensity. Fold change again uh, shows you this strong difference. And now this is with DIA, where you really have a tight cluster here, and I think I have it expanded. And also, it's interesting to see over here that you account for very quickly a very high percentage of the variance just very easily because clearly those two cells are very different. Looking at it in the heat map, this points out something, a feature between the DDA and the DIA data. Here, this is where there is very little or no um, spectra. And you saw there were many places where there were no tandem spectra produced in DDA. And you really don't know, is that protein present or not? Uh, just showing a uh, highlighted and expanded region there. Now this is with precursor intensity. This gray is missing values. For whatever reason, the areas just did not come in. So we don't have information. You would presume it means it's very low, but we're still missing a fair amount of information here from the, the precursor intensity. I'll just go through those. But now in DIA, now you'll notice these are flipped because this is lower on this side, and that's the area that would have been white on the DDA data. I was looking at it, I couldn't imagine how the results could be backwards, and then I went back and looked at my designation.
recommendations. But you see that you've got a lot of information. Again, um, for the heat map in the scaffold, so that it's visible, you can only look at a thousand proteins at a time. I laughed when I was thinking about saying that. Only look at a thousand. I remember back, I started with for protein work with an LCQ in the late 1990s, and I was happy to get maybe a hundred. So to be able to look at many thousands. But you can very easily um, highlight the first uh, thousand or whatever thousand you want. You may want to look at the lower ones and put stars in and then only show the stars. It's very quick to be able to do this. And you can see, again, by being able to expand this region, and then you can uh, scroll down and you'll actually be able to look at very small areas and then by going over to the right that's not showing, and here you can highlight and get that list if you want to know what specific proteins. I, I think it's fascinating to see that there's some areas that are not that different between the two cells while others are hugely different. Okay, I'm gonna try and give you just a couple more quick examples because I've been having so much fun with EIA and be able to really give information to the, especially the cancer researchers, uh, that it's been um, very exciting. This investor came, investigator came in and he's been evaluating different drugs to overcome uh, a resistance that develops in some of the cancer drugs. And what's a very common scheme is he'll have a vehicle, drug one, drug two, and the combination of drug one and drug two where drug two is the one that develops resistance and drug one is often something under development. And many times drug one by itself is not very effective, but when you add it to drug two, they find some very notable differences in cells that some uh, are actually in clinical trial, but they wanna know why. So we're trying to find differences in the pathways. You can see here, this was a cell lysate. Very typically we get five or 6,000 protein uh, targets and it's just amazing to me. So here, exclusive intensity, just looking at it superficially, cell one. I will say we ran these experiments all together. So there's, there's two cells, and Sam said to me afterwards, he's not doing that many samples in one day. So that's why he wanted to know if he could find a way to do uh, two separate days for it. But that's cell one and cell two, and they look pretty similar superficially there. The real question though that people are asking is what is the difference between these two? Now here's showing you log two fold change relative to vehicle because that still is the question that's important is what's happening relative to no drug treatment. And drug one, uh, cell one and cell two again looking fairly similar. Well here I did a t-test, drug two versus combo. And you'll notice because these are in yellow, that's saying that it's significant, but not with multiple testing correction. And we've had some discussions about is multiple testing correction in the traditional way really true, or really correct? Because in fact, you have other information and covariance that might not make it necessary to apply multiple testing correction or even in fact significance in the traditional sense because the covariance is really important. But here also, I had originally been displaying relative to D2, but I realized that you lose the relationship between the change from the vehicle. So I display relative to the vehicle, but the t-test is this comparison, and it's really important to be able to do that so that you can explore the data. And you see that there's quite a few, but I wanted to see, is this experiment worth looking for further? And what was wonderful to see is that D2 and the combination separated <coughs> enough that I could say, all right, there is an effect, and this one is worth now looking at. And that's, now when you look at cell two, there's not quite as much separation, but still enough because it takes a long time to evaluate the results and the investigator needed to know 
wasn't this dose reasonable? Is uh, the cell's preparations worth following? And so I was able to say to him, yes, now let's go through the date of war. And what we've been doing is generating Excel files to go into Reactome and other means of informatics. And one more quick set. Um, this is alveolar lung fluid in the TB study. And this is a very much more challenging set because this is 11 subjects. And it isn't, I mean, first off, it's human subjects, and there's the normal variations. I mean, plus, we don't always have enough information about them. Now, they were all acquired by the same pulmonologist under the exact same conditions, so they were confident that there was no experimental variability there. But we ran this. We also didn't know what to expect. And so first we did it by DDA with those same samples, uh, two-hour gradient, and there were 858 target proteins. I didn't know uh, what, how many there would be at all, but they said that there was a designation of high and low by some measure of these cells. So that's how I originally separated the data, categorized. And if you look at this, you see there's not really any obvious variation. Um, then we move to DIA, and again, uh, now we've gotten 1,900 targets, so more than double, but the exact same samples, just running them by DIA and processing through scaffold DIA. And for all of these, I am uh, generating the chromatogram library. So we go to the TCA, and this is by high and low, and there's no particular pattern. Now, something that I have noticed is this sample, and in this PCA, you can hover over, uh, you can also have all the labels displayed, but sometimes your file names are long and they're not easy to uh, print on there. But this is sample 131, and no matter how I've categorized it, it's some kind of an outlier. And I'm going to, when I go back, reprocess the data without 131 just to see what might be there. But it's enough different, no matter how I've looked at it, that it might be legitimate to consider it as an outlier, or it'll fit in when we get more samples that need to be considered. Well, then I went to the investigator and I said, all right, what else do you know about these samples? Well, at that time, he said, all I know is the sex of the subject, some of them because someone else had provided the samples and they're doing another study on them. So this is categorized by the sex of the subject. Well, we've still got this guy. The diamonds are unknown because we just don't have that information. And then we have the male and female. And as you look at this, well, it may be that this is a cluster of something and a cluster here, maybe. They're going to try and find more information and more categories about these samples. And I feel confident that as we add in, there's going to be something different. Uh, we have a little information on age, uh, ethnicity, and I will say we have some hints on the ethnicity possibly playing a big role. But by being able to look at the information graphically this way with a statistically sound method, we know whether, what to expect. I mean, you, you just can't do stats on this and find any information. So by being able to explore the data this way and have the same methods, both available in perspectives and, and DIA, so if you're using a DDA method, you can do the same analysis. And it, it's been um, amazingly powerful. I have to thank uh, Dana Muller and Sam Pardo they do all the work. I often use the royal we, and I say we do this, but if I didn't have someone making incredibly wonderful samples and great collaborators and support uh, from here, it wouldn't be possible. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer questions or during the break.